Hello. Hi. It's about 10 o'clock, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'll let some other people come in. You're welcome. Come on in, everybody. How's it going? Good morning. I really appreciate that everybody came out this morning at 10 a.m. on a Friday. It's good, especially judging by the selfies with Sue hashtag. How many of you guys were at the Field Museum last night? Yeah? How many of you guys had a really good time? I wasn't there. I missed it, unfortunately. But I got to go hang out with Sue all the time anyway, so I'm not complaining. You have a question about Sue. I can answer that. Oh, the, oh, the question was, what is mo most special about Sue the Tyrannosaur? Well, Sue is the largest and most complete Tyrannosaur skeleton that's ever been discovered. She was found in an embankment uh, near Faith, South Dakota, which is actually where my family is from. So I'm, Sue and I are like this. We're pretty close geographically in origin. Um, and she was found in an eroded, this has nothing to do with the rest of my talk. She was found in an eroded embankment. So Sue Hendricks, a uh, paleontologist with the Black Hills Institute, was walking around while two other members of her party went to go into town to fix a flat tire. It was the last day of their trip. They were going to go home. And she stops, and she just sees this vertebral column eroding out of the side. And she said, I know exactly what that is. And they went back and spent a couple of days excavating it and then shipping the field jackets back to the Black Hills Institute. And then, you know, after a number of years, the skeleton came to the Field Museum where our preparators sat in and finished completing it, you know, excavating it out of this matrix and assembling it. And so, yeah, she's 97 or 98 percent complete as a fossil, which is pretty amazing. So, yeah. Yes, she is the largest. So it is 10.01, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, again, thank you all for being here this morning. Can you hear me in the back OK? Is this a good level? All right, just feel free to holler if I'm, I need to speak up. Um, my name is Emily Grassley. I am the Field Museum's chief curiosity correspondent. That is printed on my business cards and on my door. I, I love my job title. As far as I know, I'm the world's one and only, but I advocate for changing that because I'd love to go to a Chief Curiosity Correspondent Convention someday. I <laughs> think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit first on how I got started as a science communicator, and then I'm going to talk and give some case studies about how I approach issues. I, I don't want to call them issues. They're not issues. They're challenges. They're opportunities of communicating the science of our, uh, the research of our scientists at the Field Museum. So I did not study science in college. In fact, I think if I recall, I had one basic chemistry class and maybe one geosciences course over a winter session, but I had no inclination to study or pursue science as an undergraduate. I actually graduated from the University of Montana in 2011 with a studio art degree in painting. I was a large-scale landscape painter. I mentioned, as I was talking about finding Sioux in South Dakota, that's where my family's from in rural America, and I really wanted to capture like the trials and tribulations of what it was like to be a small town rancher when your livelihood is dictated by uh, the elements around you. So I would do these huge mural-sized uh, or wall-sized murals of, of thunder cells coming in over the prairie. So that was my thing. It was about as far away from science and science communication as you can imagine until my senior year, I was three months away from graduating, starting to have that panic feeling, like, oh, why did I study studio art? What am I, where am I, I need to get a job. Where am I going to work? I'm going to work at a convenience store. Great. I'm not the future I envisioned for myself. Um, but I started kind of looking around the university. I wanted to take advantage of the rest of my time there as a student and all the resources that you know I hadn't really fully taken advantage of. And that's how I came to find the University of Montana's Philip L. Wright Zoological Museum. It was actually through a couple of classmates and a mutual friend that I discovered that the campus that I had been attending classes on for the last three and a half years had the largest and most complete representation of Rocky Mountain wildlife in the world. It had a collection of 24,000 specimens that were, some of them were 160 years old. Um, there was an incredible amount of documentation, a lot of research published. This was a, 
uh, a university collection that had been accredited by the American Society of Mammologists. It was to be a destination point for researchers in the Pacific Northwest and from the Pacific Northwest to essentially the Northern Plains. It served in a massive geographic region um, and was the largest collection of its kind between Seattle, Washington and Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it had one part-time staff member for the last 20 years. So this collection, which is um, so historically, scientifically relevant and significant was not being fully utilized, was not able to reach its potential because of a, you know, apathy from administration, years of reprioritization. And as an art major, I didn't know what my place in that collection was going to be. I didn't know if I had any business being there at all, but I knew that when I walked into that collection, for the first time I felt as though science was something that I could do. Science was a, a subject that was not beyond me as an art major who was not smart enough to understand scientific theory, not, you know, wasn't able to apply scientific method to my day-to-day -day life. You walk in there and you're, you're greeted with the physical specimen. You see something that you can handle and interact with, which is very hands-on. It's a very artistic way of approaching uh, science and research. And so I took that and I thought, I'm going to do everything in my power to advertise the interdisciplinary potential of this collection because what an amazing resource that's not being fully ta uh, um, utilized on our campus. And this is also coming, you know, I'm a couple months away from graduating and being like, why did well, I spend all of this money to come to this university and they didn't tell me we had this amazing collection? Like, I'm outraged. Take matters into my own hands. So that's essentially what I did. I started volunteering. I started um, practicing scientific illustration and it just snowballed. Um, I started becoming more familiar with the day-to-day -day work of what goes into maintaining a natural history collection. There's a lot, surprisingly. There's, and it's all time-sensitive stuff. So, for instance, if you are working with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and it's their job to uh, radio collar and track the data of, of the migrating uh, pronghorn antelope across northern Montana. And one of those antelope dies, well, it only becomes really a research or a valuable research specimen is if you actually take the specimen. And what that means is you pick up roadkill. But you're talking about the, the longevity of a dead animal here. Like decomposition is a real thing. And in order to make sure that all of the hard work that went into tracking and, um, and uh, maintaining that animal throughout its life, you want to make sure that data remains viable so we have to prepare it for a collection. And that's where I would come in as a, as a specimen preparator for this museum. So you, you, you're on a, a time limit here and you're on a resource limit so you've got to either find a freezer for a bunch of dead pronghorn antelope or you have to process them immediately so I, I was I got pretty busy um, I apologize if this gets a little gross for some of you I spend half of my time uh, dissecting animals and preparing them for collections um, so I'm a little desensitized to the topic um, but that's essentially what I was doing and it, I was learning a lot in the meantime. I was learning not only about anatomy and physiology, I was learning about uh, how these specimens could be used, um, who was using them, and how we could do a better job of advertising this work because who wouldn't want to do something like that? Who w I, I got to do some amazing things in this collection like prepare an entire grizzly bear or go out into the woods and, and find a, a um, you know, a, an animal that had been poached and then process the remains and work with the Montana State Crime Lab to find out who'd done it. It was, it was very exciting stuff. As an art major, you know, I was, I felt a little out of my element at first, but gradually came to enjoy and accept my work. So, that being said, I started a blog. It was a little bit tangential, but I started a blog. I started, um, talking about the work that we were doing every single day on Tumblr. It was umzoology.tumblr.com. And I used my art major skills to try and capture the specimens in their beauty as I saw them as um, not only uh, really valuable for research, but also just wonderful to look at. And I thought that would be a really interesting way to engage a new audience into this, um, into this collection and into this kind of work. Um, so I started that blog in October of 2011. These, were, these pictures were taken about a year later. And then a couple months after these went up, I met this guy. How many of you are familiar with Hank Green, the Vlog Brothers, the Crash Course, and UTBDU? There's a couple hands in the audience. So Hank and John Green. John Green is most well known for his book, The Fault in Our Stars, but surprisingly he's also um, a really famous YouTuber. And he and his brother Hank have started this 
um, wonderful community, and they've facilitated this wonderful community of online educators, YouTube EDU, as it's kind of known. And Hank lives in Missoula, Montana, where I was living, and I don't know how this fact was not known to me sooner, but I came to know Hank. Uh, he came to the collection. This is the museum with some of the drawers open. You have a rhinoceros skull right there. He's holding a walrus baculum, which is, a, do you guys know what a baculum is? Do you want to know? Some, some people are yes. They're like, don't tell everybody. So some animals have actually have a bone in their penis. It's called a baculum, and it's actually uh, something that you look to when you want to identify between certain species. Like some, uh, the, one of the only ways you can uh, determine the species of an animal if you don't want to do genetic testing is to by the shape and size of its baculum. That's what he's holding. It's from a walrus. It's it's uh, impressive. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's too early for this kind of humor. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, so Hank came to the museum, and, and I, I, I'm very passionate about this collection. I feel very connected, very responsible for the 24,000 things in there. there I felt a, a responsibility to take, out, take care of them, look after them. And so I talked to Hank about this, and I said, I'd really like a way to better advertise this collection, because it's not a one-off thing. It's not like the University of Montana is the only university collection or small collection that exists. There are collections like this all around the United States and all around the world, and I was just fearing that they were going by the wayside, like our collection was. They were understaffed, underutilized, weren't able to meet their full potential. So he said, I'll help you start your own YouTube show. How does that sound? That's not an opportunity you get every day. So I said, that sounds like a great time. So he came back to the museum. We filmed a tour that I gave him, just walking around, talking about some of the specimens. He put it up on his YouTube channel, The Vogue Brothers, on a Friday. And I think by Monday morning, it had been viewed some quarter of a million times. And so by Monday, he had called me, and he was like, I'll help you start a show. And I was like, sign me up. So about four weeks after that, we launched The Brain Scoop. Um, and we filmed it for the first four months out of the University of Montana before I had the opportunity to come to Chicago um, because of a, a dedicated fan of the program was really interested in helping us to um, expand a little bit out of the university wall. So I came to the, to the Field Museum where I was in a surprise job interview that I didn't know I was having. Um, the whole story is kind of, it's just, it's unreal um, to recount it, it's, it's a little strange. But anyway, I went, I went to the Field Museum in order to film their Members' Night event. And if you're from Chicago or if you're a member of the Field Museum, you're very familiar that one or two nights out of the year, they open up all of the behind the scenes of the museum. And that might not sound very impressive until you come to understand that only 1% of any of the specimens that the Field Museum has are on display at one time. That means there are 26 million specimens and artifacts that are behind closed doors that the public just generally doesn't get to see for a lack of time. Like, that'd be overwhelming. Who has time for that? Nobody's got time for that. Um, it'd take years. It has taken people years to see everything in that museum. So they wanted me to come film this Members' Night event, and I was happy to do so. And after two days of, of being at the Field Museum, they sat down and they said, we really love what you're doing with online educational video. We would love to have a program like this at our museum. And I said, that's awesome. You guys totally go for it. You're going to have the best time ever. And they said, well, we'd really need kind of like a gregarious, outspoken, enthusiastic host. And I'm like, whatever. You got like Chicago. You got like 80 colleges here. You got Second City. No problem. And they're like, we want you to do it. And I said, what? And they said, we'd love for you to bring the brain scoop to the Field Museum. And I think I like started crying. It was very unromantic. Uh, <laughs> this was very early in the morning on a Friday. I was exhausted. I was like, I don't even know what's happening right now. But anyway, uh, long story short, I moved here to Chicago 14 months ago. Uh, started at the Field in July of last year. And we've been producing the brain scoop uh, from the Field Museum ever since. Here's a p photo taken by uh, the Field's photographer with me, um, our current producer, Tom McNamara, who's from PBS in New York, and our taxidermied raccoon mascot in the background, and Janet Voigt, the curator of invertebrate zoology, during an episode where you're talking about um, diversification of octopuses. It's pretty sweet. Um, so with that, I'm going to just show you a highlight reel from some of our older episodes to give you kind of a sense of the, the flavor of the brain scoop. Flavor, I don't know why I said that word. Here we go. Hi, 
Hey, um, I'm Emily Grassley. I'm on my way to pick up a wolf that Liz said she was holding for us. A wolf? Um, it's in the freezer. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thanks. I accidentally called lens crafters. <laughs> Tetrapodal locomotion. Domestication. Horns! No, Stefan. Those are antlers. People going on these expeditions were only permitted two elephants per person. That's still a lot of elephants per person. It's some giant black wasp thing. Kind of looks like an animal of death. Every time we move the, the nether regions, we seem to get a, a revival of the delicious rotten egg, dead bacteria smell that keeps coming off of this guy. It smells like... Like air. Like angels singing. Smells like a few quiet. This is an ulna right here, which is part of one of the arm bones. Ready to dump some stink water. Oh my God! This thing is huge, are you kidding me? That thing is Check gigantic! It it's like a, a it UFO! Let's gut it. I feel fancy. <laughs> This is a caterpillar larva. Looks exactly like bird poop. It does look like poop. It's got the white bit and like mm. the runny parts. There is cottage cheese coming out of a hole. Oh, come on. It's like egg custard. I would eat egg custard. I would not lick that. Me, me, me. Me. Africa. Ancient Americas. Ancient Egypt. Asia. Botany. We've got dinosaurs. Early hominids. Ice Age mammals. Meteorites. Award-winning bathrooms. We're all home. To the mind school. We have to find another individual who has a good, healthy gut community and lick the rear end of their sister. <laughs> oh my god. That's the brain scoop in a nutshell. <clears throat> Thank you. It still has brains on it. it still has brains on it. Um, sorry, I, I always forget that there's like clips of dissections in there. I need to give you a warning. I apologize if anybody was offended. Um, that being said, so the Brain Scoop has become part of a larger online educational community um, called YouTube EDU. And these are some of my favorite channels, by no means not all of them, but I, I pulled these, um, just their logos and some, some quick statistic to give you an idea of the, the broader reach that these educational videos are having. Across these, um, I guess, six channels, their videos have been viewed over a billion times and collectively they have more than 13 million subscribers. So I'm very hopeful about the future of online video and I guess that's why I care so much about what I'm doing. We're, we're reaching a lot of folks. To give you some quick statistics about the Brain Scoop, just so you have some background if you're not familiar with the channel, um, we have 8.7 million video views, 243,000 subscribers, 95 videos, 10 hours of educational content. Our ratio is 60% men to 40% women. 44% of our views come from outside of the United States. Our most popular video is called Where My Ladies At? with 856,000 views talking about the um, need for positive female role models in the media, especially in science communication roles. Um, we have English captions on all of our videos and that have been translated into as many as 14 languages. It's pretty exciting for me to watch a video and see Japanese captions on it. Um, and it's produced with, uh, by myself and with Tom McNamara, supported by the Field Museum, and I have two volunteers. So we are a very, very, very small um, production crew, but we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without the help of the 500 scientific researchers that are at the Field Museum. In addition to the video content, I also do a lot of outreach and a lot of publicity for the museum. In the past couple of year, years, months actually, past couple of months I've won a lot of kind of silly awards. Um, that I don't know who I was competing against to win them. Best celebrity nerd of Chicago? Who's in the running for that? I think they were just being nice to me. I don't mind. It was, it was very generous of them. But it was also, you know, one of the first times that Cosmopolitan, or probably the first time Cosmopolitan magazine has ever run a picture of decomposing flesh in a dermestid beetle colony. Woo! Changing the face of Cosmo. Um, and then the picture from the Chicago Reader. I was walking out of my apartment one day and seeing your face on the front of a magazine is always kind of a trip. 
Um, I'm an accidental scientist, like, oops, I didn't know I was going to be a scientist. Um, and Chicago 20 in their 20s. So we're trying to do a lot to um, popularize science and scientific research. Um, and these three things that make a good video uh, were something that I've heard a lot of other creators share, and I don't know how useful this information is going to be to you. I'm going to tell you the secret to making great videos. And by a good video, I mean one that is shareable. One, you have to have a good host. Two, you have to have good editing. And three, you have to have good script and writing. So essentially, you just it needs to be good in order to make a good video. I don't know how helpful that is to you guys. Um, but I do, I do take all three of these things into account. And when we're talking about shareable videos, it's something that's typically, when it's on YouTube, quick-paced, funny, witty, topical, relevant, um, in, the, in the way that it's like self-referential, but also contextualized in a, in a greater dialogue. Um, and identify your audience. Who really are you talking to? I feel like I have the luxury of talking to a very wide general audience. Um, so I'm, that's not too limiting for me. So with that being said, I'm going to run through a couple of potential challenges I've run into my job in trying to communicate the work of our scientists. As a non-scientist, it can be challenging um, to even understand the vocabulary when you're talking with somebody. And I have this, um, I really want the brain scoop to be, and it is uh, transforming into something that is incorporated into our scientists' greater um, impact and outreach as far as, um, sorry, I need to start that over. Um, so when a scientist wants to apply for like an, an NSF grant, they have to write into their grant that they're going to do um, broader impact outreach. And an easy way for them to do that is to say, well, we're going to have an episode of the Brain Scoop. But it's got to be factual. It's got to be relevant. And it has to do with their work. So here's a potential challenge number one. If researchers um, are, are seeking outlets for broader impact, but their work is technically complicated and nuanced. How do they reach and engage an audience? Case study one, I was approached by um, our curator of vertebrate paleontology who does work on early proto-mammals and non-mammalian synapsids. I had no idea what those words meant. But here I am and I'm like, I really want to talk about your work. He uh, studies things like Dimetrodon and Gorgonopsians and other things that I didn't know weren't dinosaurs. So I put this up here because you know, I emailed him being like, I'd love to talk about these um, mammal-like reptiles. And then you know, in an email response that CC'd to everybody in the department, he totally calls me off being like, no, you're wrong. Mammalian-like reptile is not the, the <laughs> phrase that we want to use. So then, of course, I'm like, dang, I have a lot to learn in the next two weeks before we make this video. Um, but he had this really great paper that really easily uh, understood called Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur using tree thinking to understand ancient relatives of mammals and their evolution. Um, how do we make this a topic that's relevant to people today? That was the big challenge with this episode. Um, but we went ahead and did it. This is Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur. It went up on May 31st and it has 73,000 views. Pretty good for broader impact considering the alternative is setting up a booth in field museums like Stanley Field Hall and like maybe interacting with a couple dozen people talking about this. But this is the challenge that I had. Um, I, you all laugh because you're like, I don't know what that means. Same here. Um, if you can look all the way on the far, I guess it's your left, you see words like lungfish, frog, and salamander. I totally get what that is. I know what a salamander is. That's not the challenging part. The challenging part is the words underneath, starting with words like phylogeny. That's where I start to, you start to lose me. And then you talk about synapsida groups, including erythritids. I still can't pronounce that word. How am I supposed to communicate the work of this scientist when I don't even know what I'm talking about? I'll break it down for you. So here, that, that is where dinosaurs are. Birds are dinosaurs. They're on this little branch of the tree where the red dot is. Over there, that's where Dimetrodon is, the work that the scientist is focusing on. That is the last place where these two animals were genetically or most closely related, and that's where we are. So how can I use this information to say something that makes sense? Well, one way to translate all of this jargon is to say we are more closely related to Dimetrodon than Dimetrodon is related to dinosaurs. I think we did it all right. We also use this video to talk about relational terms. When you're talking about diversification of early animals, um, that doesn't make a lot of sense to people. But when you say things like a bat can fly and a bird can fly, but that doesn't mean bats are related to birds. 
That's another concept people have a pretty good time understanding. But just because two species have shared characteristics, they're not genetically related. Here's another graph. Dimetrodon, and I guess I should have clarified this before if you don't know what Dimetrodon is, it's that sailback dinosaur. You guys know what I'm talking about, kind of? Some people, maybe. You'll know by the end of this. So Dimetrodon is the big full skeleton right there. And what I'm trying to talk about is that Dimetrodon is our relative. We are related to, we pretty much came from Dimetrodon. People say, how, you know, if humans came from apes, why do apes still exist? The same question is like, if we came from Dimetrodon, how did Dimetrodon exist? It's all evolutionary relationship. Um, one doesn't replace the other. But anyway, what do these two have in common? Everything on this family tree and us. Well, boom, we have shared traits. We have something that's called a temporal opening, which is a characteristic that scientists can trace through the fossil record over time to link um, different animals from one another, different organisms to find these genetic relations. The big question is why or how does anybody care about <laughs> any of this? Um, but people do. So here's a just quick graph of geographic distribution of the views. And obviously most of them come from the United States, but when you start to get into it a little bit more. The video was successful to a point where like, we had people in Lithuania watching this. 108 people from Lithuania watched this video about non-mammalian synapsid evolutionary history, which I think is pretty good for broader impact for our scientists. io9 picked up the video, which is another 43,000 hits of like, we, he used this as, uh, as a case study to talk about his work. And the most engaging way um, I got people to participate in this, in this uh, conversation and the way that people related it to the most is that we started a campaign called Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur. And that was basically putting the onus on everybody else to go out and find examples of when Dimetrodon was marketed and sold in stores labeled as a dinosaur. Because the whole point of my spiel and getting all upset about the fact that Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur is that I feel when you market it and just say, yeah, it is, um, you're really not celebrating the, the diversity of early life. You're really kind of cheating people out of understanding where we came from and, and the wonderful animals that existed before the dinosaurs because, surprise, there was life on this planet for hundreds of millions of years before dinosaurs existed. Let's not all call early life dinosaurs. That's all I'm advocating for. But Anyway, I started this blog called Is Not a Dinosaur, and people continue to send me pictures of toys and things that are called dinosaurs, and they get all upset about it, and, uh, and I get upset about it, and we laugh and go on with our lives. So, oh no, I don't think their marketing team cares that much, but when I launch my own line of educational toys, you can bet I will market them as synapsid snappers or something way cooler. <laughs> Potential challenge number two. That was, that was pretty nuanced and we're gonna generally get it out. So that was a pretty complicated case study. Potential challenge number two. Field biologists occasionally require the collection of specimens from the field in order to conduct valuable research, but how should they discuss the necessary realities of their work when they fear backlash from the public for their methods? This is a complicated topic. Nobody wants to go out and say, yes, I collected 100 bats for my research project about bats, and yeah, those bats died. That's something that is a difficult uh, subject to publicize and, uh, and talk about um, to a large audience because of animal rights organizations that want to burn down your place of work when you admit to doing so much. So this came up because of um, this was an opinion piece that was published in Science Magazine, Avoiding Re-Extinction by Mintir et al. Um, this was published uh, April 22nd of this year. And the part that I want to highlight is that this is an opinion piece that is talking about a, a very specialized area of science where he had a pretty radical opinion that as we study our natural world, as we take samples um, from the environment, as biologists and people who conduct field research, should we be collecting specimens that we are not 100% sure are at risk? Because if they are and we collect a sample, are we going to have a negative impact on that population to the extent that we are causing the extinction as biologists? Never mind the fact that more animals are run over on United States highways every year than comprise the entire collection um, at the National Museum. Um, it's a pretty nuanced uh, conversation. 
And of course, I wanted to bring it out to the public because I think that the public under deserves to have an in on these discussions that are happening behind closed doors, aka paywalls, um, of the scientific community. So that was not a very popular opinion piece that was published. Here is a list of all of the authors that co-authored a response piece to Mintier. Um, <laughs> 121 scientists representing 59 of the top institutions across the world, including quite a few field museum biologists. So that just kind of gives you a sense of who, who, like who in the scientific community was aligning with what side of the opinion. Um, I made a video about it because I like to ruffle feathers, no pun intended, here I am with a dead bird that hit a window. Um, we called the, the, the video, Where'd You Get All Those Dead Animals? Because that's a question that I receive a lot. When you tell people that we have three million mammals in our collection at the Field Museum, people say, did somebody kill all of those? And you say, no, not all of them, not most of them, but some of them. And here's why we did it. In the 1960s, you have instances of, um, I'll go back, um, there are instances many uh, in, a, in a museum's history where their collection actually worked to save not just the population that was being studied, but helped to conserve, conserve entire environments, such as like the use of DDT in the 1960s. Nobody knew that there was a link between the use of DDT and nesting failures in birds, and these were significant. The whole reason that we have um, some of these um, government acts in place to preserve large raptors is because of things like DDT. But the link wasn't made until biologists went to a, co a museum collection and were able to look at eggs that were collected before the use of DDT and look at eggs that were collected after the use of DDT when these raptor specimens were at serious risk of, of extinction. And they found that uh, the, the thickness of the egg was compromised so that DDT was um, affecting the structure of the egg. The eggs were not solid, they were turning into mush, and you were having dead birds everywhere. That would have not been possible had biologists not been going out in the field and collecting before and after a continued uh, collection throughout the use of DDT. Another instance is something we're living through right now, which is white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that affects uh, something like 98% of all hibernating bat species in the United States. And if you don't think that bats are going to have a huge positive impact on your life, just wait until they die and then malaria abounds in North America. Because bats are incredibly beneficial, not only as seed dispersers, um, the insect and insectivorous bats cut down on disease spread through insects. Um, so anyway, these are case studies where biologists have gone out into the field and you can't understand white nose syndrome unless you go out and collect a couple of bats that have the, the living fungus in them in order to study how it's developing in the animals, how we can stop it, what, how is it transmittable, Does it, can humans contract it? Um, so that is essentially what we talked about in, in my video, Where'd You Get All Those Dead Animals? Um, they're, the videos are edited, so I say it much more succinctly with this script than I do in a live talk. But here's the timeline. So the Mentir opinion piece went out on 18th of April. The response piece by all those scientists went out on the 23rd of May. I made my episode that went up on the 4th of June, two weeks later, and then NPR wrote this article that was published a um, couple weeks after that. Is collecting animals for science a noble mission or a threat? Well, that makes this pretty much a black and white issue, which it's not. It's a very complicated issue with very strong opinions on either side. Um, it's not a topic for, for yes, no answer, and the general public typically has very little understanding of how research is conducted. Therefore, they aren't given the necessary tools to critically interpret this informa information within the broader context of conservation. And what that leads to is when you're judging the success of a video, when you're judging the impact of whether or not you have actually positively influenced someone's opinion about um, an issue, is whether or not you want to admit it, sometimes looking at the comments of the video. I have a difficult time quantifying the success of my video outside of views, view duration, um, and geographic distribution, but I do look to the comments um, we're, that's still up in the air of whether or not that's valuable. Um, but I, f I think it's pretty indicative of general uh, population's consensus of how they interpreted the information. 
But this is the kind of comment that, this was the most recent comment on that article, and this is kind of what makes me just want to smash my face into the wall. It's not okay. It makes me sick how scientists do this. It's not like they take one or two animals. Science museums all over the world are out there collecting, so that's thousands, perhaps millions. Yes, it is millions of animals. Uh, collected. I remember watching the movie Ghost Bird about the ivory bill woodpecker, and at the science museum they opened a drawer that had rows and rows of woodpeckers in them. What the hell? Why do you need more than one of each sex? And this just, it goes on and on. It's like, clearly this person doesn't understand the value of natural history museums, and I have failed <laughs> as, a, as a spokesperson for a natural history museum. But this is not a one-off comment. This is the general consensus. When you have an article with, with the subject line painting this issue as a black and white issue, that's the response you're going to get from the public, and we haven't done a good job as a natural history museum of advocating why we have these collections in the first place. Um, but thankfully, going back to that handy little timeline, I made my video two weeks before that NPR article went out. And my big success, the top comment on that, Despite the fact she misspelled my name, thank you, Yvonne. Emily Grassley of the YouTube series Brain Scoop addressed the science article cited in the story in one of her recent videos. She goes on to explain that collecting is important. A lot of people were driven from the NPR article to my video, and I got an, an amazing, overwhelming, positive response that people are happy that they can now understand the issue. They're given the tools to interpret this information, and going ahead, they can participate in the discussion. So it's not just a conversation happening between scientists behind a paywall. I felt good about that one. Thanks, Yvonne. Potential challenge number three. Despite the incredible amount of collective effort that goes into understanding our shared natural world, the work of scientists is oftentimes undermined by sensationalist media that perpetuates myth as fact. How can the factual work of the scientific community gain traction in a meaningful way within the public without debilitating or overloading the audience? This is something I struggle with all of the time because as we approach mid-century, uh, mid-21st century, we, are, we have these looming threats that we are living through the sixth major mass extinction event. 30 to 40% of all life on this planet is going to be extinct in the next 30 years. Man, people get tired of hearing you talk about that. But so how do we maintain interest uh, from our audiences and engagement without overloading them with this doomsday approach to our work. It becomes difficult when you have things like <clears throat> the Discovery Channel. I hope nobody here is from Discovery. I don't want to get sued today, please. Um, but this is just a case study. This is looking at uh, popular science communication in our media. Either you have YouTube or you have network cable channels. And if you're going to network cable channels for your educational content, this is the kind of thing that you get. Um, this is my personal opinion, and I, I was enacted by this list of their programming to, to contribute to some more um, educational content. So you have programs that Discovery has, like Air Jaws, Fin of Fury, Shark of Darkness, Shark Death, Death Shark, Kill Shark, Kill. That's how I summarize the title of their programs. Here are my other interpretations, giant terrifying 18-foot sharks, deadliest sharks. Uh, perpetuating the idea that a species that went extinct 1.5 million years ago is still existing in our oceans. That's not true at all. Megalodon is dead. Um, vicious shark feeding behaviors. Sharks are going to kill everybody. Everybody's going to die from sharks. Don't go swimming in the ocean. Sharks are murderous, terrible animals. Oh, boy. But what's the big deal? Who cares? Does anybody really go to Discovery for their educational content? Is anybody really tuning in, hoping that they're going to learn anything? Or is this all just entertainment? Is it all just whatever that they can come up with in order to get more views so they can get their advertiser dollars? Are they driving traffic to really empower their audience with information or is it just scare tactics? Well, you know, thinking about it this way, sharks have existed on our planet for more than 400 million years and have survived every single mass extinction event in our world's history. They're some of the only animals that have been able to do that. Sharks are amazing. <laughs> uh, evolutionarily. They are keystone species as apex predators. They maintain a fine balance in our, their environments to keep oceans healthy by feeding off of the sick and old. Without sharks, other predators with more specialized diets will take their place. Mesopredators feed off of uh, herbivorous fish, so plant life flourishes and as a result algae blooms out of control, killing coral reefs. Other mesopredators feed off of shellfish and crustaceans. In addition to the consequences this depletion has on the commercial industry, which affects humans, because I like to eat scallops. I don't know about you guys. 
Um, without anyone feeding off the mesopredators like skates and rays, they will quickly exhaust their own food supply and then you have an entire collapse. Just, in, just environmental habitat collapse in our oceans. Um, we don't even understand our oceans enough to, we know more about the surface of Mars than we know about our own oceans. So it's, we need to be thinking about these things. The big deal is that as many as 70 to 100 million sharks are killed every year as a result of habitat destruction, bycatch from unregulated fishing, and finning to meet the demands of the luxury food industry. Up to 90% of certain populations have disappeared. Ooh, I need to update my computer. Sorry. Um... The International Union for Conservation of Nature reports that 24% of all cartilaginous fish, which are rays, skates, and sharks, are threatened with extinction. And the only reason that this graph uh, on your left tapers off, um, this is the number of sharks by tons that are, that are fished out of our oceans every year, is because the populations are disappearing. They've hit a peak and they are declining. Um, it's pretty sad stuff. But what are we going to do about it? I'm not about just whining that we can't change anything. I'm going to change something. So I teamed up with my buddies, U2B to U, to create several, several consecutive calendar days dedicated to predatory cartilaginous fishes because we couldn't call it Shark Week. <laughs> I'm sneaky. So the, this is just a playlist that runs at the end of our videos. Uh, we made a huge collective playlist. YouTube EDU generated five and a half million views over 13 videos. We only had 60 minutes of programming because a lot of these other channels are either created by one or two people. We don't have the luxury of having major networks with hundreds of millions of dollars to support tons of camera crews. It's myself and Tom McNamara at the Field Museum. Um, to give you a comparison, Discovery Shark Week this year reported an average of 2 million people per hour-long program that they featured, 42 million viewers, which is a lot, but they were still down 9 million from last year, which gives me a little bit of hope. Um, the Brain Scoop, not one to not go totally all out with all of this. We figured, well, if Shark Week's going to have a program every day, darn it, so are we. Don't do that. If you're, if you're a production group of two people, a video every day for five days will kill you, but I survived and it was worth it. So on the Brain Scoop, we did five consecutive calendar days dedicated to predatory cartilaginous fishes. And in doing this, we wanted to share the work that our conservationists, our scientists were doing uh, to help inform um, in, uh, conservation issues regarding sharks and, and overfishing. And it's easy to go to the fishes department because the fishes people there study sharks, it makes sense. But shark conservation is happening all across our museum. And that's one of the beauties of working in a natural history museum that is so interdisciplinary. So we had one episode called Why Sharks? We worked with our fishes department and the topic was healthy shark populations are imperative to maintaining healthy oceans. Pretty straightforward, that's how we started our week. Um, we wrapped up the week. This was shark, shark, sharks, and more sharks because I ran out of titles for episodes by that point. But this was, again, we worked with our fishes department, which they have millions of fish specimens at the Field Museum. So we could use, we could actually use specimens like this sawtooth, which I'm standing in front of. The sawtooth is a kind of fish that is uh, protected by CITES, incredibly endangered. The rostrum is like their nose. This thing is probably eight feet long, which means the rest of the fish is about 23 feet. You're talking about a 23, it's like the size of a school bus, this massive fish in the ocean. We don't know anything about it. And they're going to die before we can ever learn anything about them, but, which is a total bummer. I shouldn't go off on that tangent. Um, but anyway, so it's really great that we can actually use the collection to talk about these topics. Um, there are 13 living orders of sharks in our oceans today, and I bet if you went on the street and polled people about how many sharks they could name, they'd probably say, like, Great White, Hammerhead... Are there any other ones? But there are a lot of other sharks. Um, so we wanted to make an episode addressing an, uh, an example or two from all of these different orders to have people have a better appreciation of their diversity. We also worked with our uh, friends in geology at the Field Museum because Megalodon is in fact extinct, but it is a pretty cool topic um, to talk about how does a shark become fossilized or preserved in the fossil record if their skeleton is made of cartilage and not bone. That was a topic that I didn't know I cared about until we started doing this program. 
Um, we talked about other sharks in the fossil record, shark diversification, uh, Helicoprion, uh, or Helicoprion, which is the, the world tooth shark. If you guys should just Google image search this thing. It has like a buzz saw in its jaw with teeth that just continuously grow out in a spiral. And you're like, I don't even know how that evolved. What's going on? Uh, so we talked about that. We talked about shark weapons. This was one of my favorite topics. We went to our anthropology department, an unlikely candidate for talking about shark, shark conservation. But the topic was how do you know or how can you judge species uh, diversity and um, distribution if you don't have a written record? Like you can't go back in time and, and figure out where a certain species of shark was living because it's not like it wrote a diary and left it anywhere and be like today i was in the eastern pacific that's not it's going to happen how do you find this evidence well there are people in the area of kiribati in the central pacific who were fishing sharks and using their teeth in their weaponry they made weapons out of shark teeth. I cannot think of anything cooler than shark tooth made weapons, except for the armor that they would wear, which was made out of woven human hairs and coconut fiber. It's insane. Watch this video. Um, but some ichthyologists, some fish people, and some anthropologists worked together because they realized after a point, you can actually identify the species of shark based off of the tooth. So by identifying the tooth, you can see what shark they were fishing. And they went through, realized that they were utilizing a couple dozen different species of shark. But surprise, three of those species are no longer found in the area. So what happened over the last like 100 or 150 years since these weapons are from the turn of the uh, 20th century? It's just an interesting uh, take on like how we can use both collections to figure out these problems, or uh, not the problems, but find solutions to these questions. And the last one was shark fin CSI, which is another pretty interesting topic, going back to my roots and my love of forensic science. Um, this is, a, I'm holding a whale shark fin. That thing is huge. A whale shark is one of the largest fishes in the ocean, and the fin of it is, you know, a good meter tall. Um, but in 2012, Illinois became the first non-coastal state to put a ban on the sale if, or which ones, um, already have a ban on that species if we can't tell what the species is because they've already prepared the food for human consumption, the food, the fin. Um, this is a complicated issue because you, uh, you can't put the cart before the horse. You can't say that all shark fins are, are off the radar because some of them have not been federally protected. Some of them are not recognized as endangered species because we can't work fast enough because the paperwork takes too long. Long story short, our field museum biologists working with Stony Brook Institute and with like Chicago Police Department were able to develop a new method of extracting genetic information from these chemically prepared shark fins in order to figure out the species so that the businesses selling them could be correctly charged. So this is us helping to put an end to the shark fin trade. Um, so that was, those were the episodes that we talked about during our shark fin. These are all ongoing scientific um, projects. They, they are things with information supported by published research papers. It's not shark death, shark, shark murder sharks. Um, and to give you some more follow-up, the view s video statistics, we had 211 views across those five videos. They only went up about a month or six weeks ago. And the average view duration was 77% which I think is pretty good. That's a C in school. That's pretty average. Um, but considering, you know, audience retention is something that we really strive for. Views are counted if you click on it and then immediately clicked away, so you can't really judge your success by view count, but the duration is something that we go by, so I was pretty proud about that. Um, and here's a picture just that makes me feel pretty good. This was uh, at a panel that I did, uh, VidCon 2014 this year. VidCon is the largest online video convention in the world. I sat on a panel with some of my friends and colleagues uh, w with other YouTube educational channels. The topic of the conversation was entertainment and education on YouTube, is it possible? I think judging by the thousand people crammed into that room, yes, it is very much possible. And with that, I wanna leave it open uh, for some questions. Um, and just say thank you so much for, for coming to my talk today, and I really appreciate it. Take care. Hi there. Um, Hi. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about your producing schedule, like how long 
I, I, like take us through the whole cycle of like conceiving a topic. Do you have di different approval processes? Writing a script. Do the scientists see the finished piece for fact checking purposes? All it, that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, that that's a tricky topic because it has never once repeated itself. We have no formula. Sometimes Shark Week will come up and we have like two weeks and we're like, oh, we should do something for Shark Week. Well, let's film five episodes. And then it's pretty rapid, like identify the topics, reach out to the department, see who has time to work with us, what specimens are available. So it's a like really, it's a real give and take. Like we have topics that we could talk about that are scientifically important, but we don't have any specimens to help supplement the video and the luxury of being in a field at the field museum is that we can use specimens for our topics um, I retain complete creative control over my programming I publish the videos and they do not need to go through a review process which is an amazing luxury that I <laughs> am incredibly grateful for because it expedites our production schedule immensely the second that you have to go through a review process sending it to scientists sending it to administration sending it to whomever we're, we just can't act as quickly as we need to to remain topical. So it's something that I, I take very seriously. I do fact check with our scientists when appropriate. Um, and we've, we haven't really screwed up yet, knock on wood. So, yeah. So I have a five-year-old and he watches a lot of YouTube videos through our accounts. And so of course on Netflix it thinks that I like Breaking Bad and also Amazing Spider-Man and Godzilla. Like story of my life. And so, <laughs> so I'm wondering if, if you know any more about your analytics, like how do you, if you're able to tell kind of what ages you're reaching and which ways you find that kind of information out. Yeah, that we take our analytics with a grain of salt really because exactly of that purpose. Like when you look at people in the Middle East who are watching our videos, it's 98% men. Well, because most women aren't allowed to have their own computers, so you can't really judge it based off of that. Um, a lot, you know, when I first started this program, we were 50-50 men and women, and it gradually went from our largest demographic being 13 to 17 year olds to being 35 to 45 year olds. And I'm like, well, we really didn't change the content. And what I think it is, is we're, we're, we are reaching a younger audience, but they're watching with their parents. Yeah. So it's difficult to say. Um, you know, and I'm pretty fortunate that I don't need to to justify the success of my videos in that way to our board of directors or board of trustees. I explain to them that it's really difficult to know. Just YouTube just hasn't built it in to have more specific analytics. So we do go by things like geographic distribution, um, the number of people who show up to live events that I do, our continued publications, and comparing ourselves and our educational channel to that of other museums and institutions because we blow them out of the water. Cool, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of answered this in your first one, but I'm with the UC Davis Wildlife Health Center and I'm trying to take them from just a gen general newsletter to like more narrative visual storytelling. And I find that I, I am in a situation where I do need to have them review stuff how did you, if you're talking to different people for different videos, do any of them say, oh, can I see this before you put it up or can you run it by me? How do you handle that interaction? It's a case by case basis. Um, and it is challenging. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't challenging. As a non-scientist going to somebody who is an expert in their field, and saying something as wrong as like, I want to talk about your mammal like reptiles. And they're like, you are so wrong. Why are they going to hand over their baby to me to take care of when I can't even call it by the right name, you know? So there is like, there's a trust thing. And that's really wonderful that I am full time at the Field Museum so that I can foster these relationships and letting them know that I can be your advocate. I can be your outreach component. But there has to be, it's a two-way conversation. You know, you have to work with me with my limited resources and I will work with you trying to get what you need to say across. But that being said, I work with 500 scientists. So they also understand to some degree, if they're going to be too difficult, our production schedule means I gotta move on something and I will go to somebody else. So it's kind of like, we gotta play nice on the playground, guys. But I have had an overwhelmingly positive uh, time in doing so. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, have you been able to identify things that maybe you can relate to the growth you've seen in the channel? And I'm curious as to any promotion that you do outside of YouTube, if it's on social media, and if it is social media, is there a way to, that you do it? Is there a strategy? Is there a type of headline that you go for, topics? No, I don't, 
I don't know how social media works. And I have a lot of followers on social media. I don't get it. I, I feel like I relate well to my audience in the, the, uh, the audience that uses social media. You know, I identify that our Facebook users are different than our Tumblr users, but I do identify well to our Tumblr users because a lot of them are recent college graduates or going to be recent college graduates that don't know what they're doing with their life, that need some kind of reassurance that there is a hope for the future. I've been that person, so on to some level you can relate to them. I think having an identifiable person behind social media infinitely helps your business or your cause. Because if you just have like a generic CNN is retweeting this, who is, who is it? Who cares? Who picked that topic? Why should I care? Somebody at CNN cares, but I don't know who they are. Can I identify with that person? So I think that by me having a physical face for the Field Museum makes us far more approachable and you know, I invite people in. I like to have that two-way audience engagement. So, but I mean, I tweet pictures of like recipes that I make and people are like, oh, I need to try that cookie. So I don't. So as of right now, it's just on YouTube. You guys don't promote too much outside. Oh, we do. Channel. I mean, we, I have 78,000 followers on Tumblr, but I also like repost illustrations that I like. So it's, it's just that there's, there's a person that has a unique interest and a unique voice that's behind the social media that people identify with. I don't know if you follow me on social media, please tell me why. <laughs> I hope that helps, thank you. Emmy, E-H-M-E-E. -E -E. And I, the gray font didn't show up, so I apologize. You can find us youtube.com slash thebrainscoop or thebrainscoop at gmail. Yeah. Hi. Okay. I have a quick two part question. So the first, you said that you script everything. Do you completely go by script, or do you kind of ad lib as you go along, or how do you kind of prepare that? There's a there's a good balance between having unscripted content and scripted content. Um, once you get scripted content, if I have a, pay, a script that's three pages long, it's going to take me like eight hours to come up with that, and it'll take like three hours to record it if we don't use a teleprompter, which makes it more spontaneous, but if we do use a teleprompter, it'll take like 40 minutes, but then it's, you're reading from a teleprompter and people can tell. Um, so I think having a mix of things that aren't scripted versus scripted, um, th that really helps with the videos. And we do try to keep it pretty spontaneous. Okay, and then my next question was, what's the length that you found that really works well for people to kind of stay engaged for the longest amount of time? Consistently across our videos, it doesn't matter if it's a one minute video or a 15 minute video, it stays between 77 and 82 percent retention. Okay. So, what's our average video length? Usually between six to ten minutes, but I mean, I go by that really obnoxious idiom that your teachers would always tell it's as long as it needs to be <laughs> to get the content across. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I'll be available for more questions. <laughs>